say welcome to everyone here um, on our CUDA mode Discord server. Great to see so many people here tonight. Or it's maybe it's a tonight for me. So I know we are like <laughs> all over the world. So depending on where you are, it's like a different time of day. Um, yeah, today we we have uh, lecture six already, and we'll go into a little bit more involved <laughs> advanced topics today with optimizers, but are, of course like in its own a little bit uh, complex topic. And um, yeah, so great to have um, like Jane here today um, from the PyTorch core team um, who will give us the presentation. So in general, um, as, as um, a mode here, we the presentation, I don't know exactly how long Jane has prepared, but normally we do it for like something about one hour. Um, you can ask questions in this companion uh, chat, which goes with the um, stage channel. And then I'll try or Mark, somebody will uh, maybe fiddle in this uh, like interesting questions and forward them. And then afterwards, maybe also if you want to come on the stage and ask directly questions, you can also do this. Okay, and then I think, uh, yeah, I can hand over now to Jane. Uh, the stage is yours. Andreas, yeah, I would love questions. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I will be asking you questions, so I also want answers in the chat. But yes, hello, I'm Jane. I work on PyTorch uh, Optimizer specifically. And today, we're going to talk about optimizing them. And you might be like, well, 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 when we talk about optimization, there are two types. There is runtime optimization, where you try to make things faster. And then there is memory optimization, where you're trying to make things take smaller memory. And sucks to suck, but these two things often are at odds with each other. So if you already know what I mean, stick with me. If you don't, well, here's an illustration. So let's say you are towing cars. You have the job of towing 512 cars from point A to point B. And you are one person, so you can only drive one truck. Which truck do you go with? So if you're a bad driver like me, then you might go with a smaller truck. But if you're a reasonable driver, you probably would take the big truck because you could get eight cars at a time. So let's take you 64 trips versus 512 trips where you might spend your entire life towing cars versus just one eighth of your life doing so. Okay, so that is kind of like now you get to do things faster. But what if I told you that on the way to B, you must pass through this bridge. So this bridge has a low clearance bridge and your big truck unfortunately is not gonna do well to fit through that bridge. So in this constraint, constrained environment, you're gonna be like, well, I guess I'll have to take you know, the smaller car. And this is how runtime and memory usually work where you could go faster, but if your system is too constraining, you might be forced to go back to the slow option so you can fit things more. And this goes the other way too. Sometimes you trade off runtime to save memory, and there are a bunch of other things. A bunch of other work regarding there, this half as well for that. But that is not today's discussion. Today, we focus on speed, and we do not, we, are, we don't worry about the small car, we don't worry about constraints. We are just gonna talk about how PyTorch is optimizing performance runtime for optimizers. And yes, this does mean that some of these techniques require a memory hit, but that is fine, that is just a disclaimer. So with that, we're gonna move on um, to the actual high level idea. And I'm gonna pause, like have silence moments. So Mark and Andreas or whoever, if you wanna like jump in with questions, those are your moments. But also feel free to interrupt me at any time. I feel kind of blind because I can't see anyone right now, but here we go. So the, so the high level idea is, okay, let's say, I, I guess I don't know if everyone knows what optimizers are, and if you don't know what optimizers are and you still showed up, props to you, awesome. But all you got to know is that optimizers just take a big list of parameters or tensors or just like things and another big list of gradients. And based on your gradients, you're going to update the parameters. So usually in SGD, the simplest one is just to do some sort of um, add and multiply between the two and a step size. But just like you have big lists of parameters that you're working with. And the simplest way to do this parameter update is to go one by one. So in this code, which is actually a simplified version of our actual code, and if you're curious about our actual code, it is in this link on the left, but you don't have to worry about that. You can just look. There is a for loop, and that's exactly, it, it's just as straightforward as you'd imagine it is. You like retrieve all the things you need from your for loop, 
and then you do every operation. So you have an add, and then you have a multiply, and then blah, 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 lerp, another multiply, and at the very end, you have an add C div, which finally coagulates your results into the first param. And then you do this all over again for the second param and the third param, so on and so forth until n. So if you're trying to think of how can I visualize this on the high level, take a look at this tiny little illustration here where every gray circle is just an operation. So like addition or multiplication or lerp in this case. And note that every column is one parameter. So for the first parameter, you are doing you know, an add and then a lerp, a mole, blah, blah, blah. And the last one is an add C div. And then right after you finish your first param, you go on to do the second param and third param and so on and so forth. So if you had n params and m opt um, operations, then you can imagine there are m times n of these little gray circles. And this, you might, you might already guess what's going on um, with fusion is we want to kind of fuse them together to get from m times n to a smaller number. And the second optimizer we have, which is our common default today. So when you use optimizers, we are, this is the one, this is the one it's calling. This is, this is a code that is gonna actually call under the hood. And it's called for each. And the reason it's called for each is instead of the for loop, you can already see this line, this code is shorter. I, I guess I put dot, dot, dot here. So yeah, whatever. But it's shorter because you don't have a for loop anymore. You are actually working on big, big lists at a time. So instead of doing one step add, you're doing, hey, I'm just adding all these steps by one. And so you, you no longer have this for loop and you still have the same number of operations. So M operations, but you no longer have that horizontal like column wise for every param since you're doing them all at once. So in here you have blue circles. And if you can guess, this would be M blue circles, one for every operation. And lastly, we have our fastest optimizer, which is the fused optimizer. If you look at the code, it's even simpler. It is literally one call. And you might be like, well, Jane, it's one call, but you're, it's just like caught fused atom. Like we still don't really know what that is. Well, I'll just tell you, it is. it ends up going tracing through our dispatcher into this CUDA kernel. And where did we get this CUDA kernel from? Well, thanks NVIDIA, Apex beat us to it. They, they did this first, we were inspired and we're like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna do that, that looks smart. So um, we work with NVIDIA to kind of like port, the, port these things over. And now we have a kernel for it. And since it is just one operation, we go from this like many M operations to just one because it is both horizontally fused and vertically fused. So to summarize the gist is for the same amount of computation that you're doing, if you can launch fewer kernels on CUDA, your code will just be faster because kernel launches are expensive. And it's the same premise as the first slide where I showed you like the more tensors you can carry to CUDA at a time um, and have it process it, the shorter, the, the shorter you'll need to be because there's a cost of launching a kernel. All right, so this is the high level. I'm gonna pause here. Do people have questions, comments so far? That, 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 there's one question from um, Jutz, um, he or she asks, so is this essentially distributing the ops in the for loop in each um, um, SM, in each uh, uh, multiprocessor? Um, I, th I think, yeah, the question here is probably for fusion because you have now mentioned like the two different ways that we first, if we start with the loop, um, that we of course like can first uh, execute all the like elements, excess elements in the list uh, concurrently, and then also of course fuse the operations in the other <laughs> dimension. Uh, yes, I think you are, you are, you're preempting my next slides. We're gonna get into it. But yes, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> what you're thinking is correct. Let's, let's do it. Okay. So you're like, okay, Jane, I get the high level. What is, what is the nitty gritty? Show me that. And the main tool is this function we have called multi-tensor apply. And okay, if you remember from biology that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, well, you can remember from today that multi-tensor apply is the power truck of our speedy optimizers. Okay, don't quote me, please. That This can stay here, I suppose. But basically, multi-tensor apply allows us to operate over a list of tensors at a time versus a single tensor. And I, the, your questions are showing, you're like jumping ahead. You're like, so how, how, how does that work? And it is very, it's very close to what you think it would be. 
but let's entertain ourselves. So with the simple torch add, if you imagine add as, well, okay, well, add is just like you add A to B or self to other to get a resulting tensor. Um, and that's kind of like you taking one tensor, you give it to CUDA, CUDA adds it for you, and you bring it back. Well, in our for each add, we have a tensor list of self. So the self has multiple tensors. Other has multiple tensors, and it should return a resulting tensor list. So this, if you're if you're confused about this notation, this is our native functions.yaml. This is like not legit anywhere else, but this is just if you look this up in our code base. Like under the hood in CUDA, how would you actually do this? So again, let's look at the easier add version. A simplified CUDA kernel signature will look like the following. And you might be like, hey, I've looked at Torch. This is not how you do add. And yes, I know, this is not how we do add. We, we do add through this other thing called tensor iterator, but we don't need to think about that today. Instead, I just want you to focus on like, if you were to write an add kernel, what would it look like? And it probably looks something like what I have on the left, where all the code is like, you, you can do the, I didn't bother doing that, but the signature itself is already pretty indicative. So note that we can't pass tensor objects into CUDA because you just, that's not, CUDA's too low level for that. So what we end up doing instead was we pass in a float star. And we're assuming we have float tensors for simplicity. If, if you had a Boolean, this would be a Boolean star it, or yeah, a bool star, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is without loss of generality. And so that, that's the first thing. The float star is a pointer to the first element in your tensor, and it will know how to move based on, based on like your kernel below. So you pass in that, that's all good. You have self, you have other, but notice that you also have this res tensor, which is your return tensor. It's because in CUDA, you, you want to operate on things all living in CUDA, and so your add kernel will actually return void and do things on CUDA. I think this should be familiar to people. And if not, feel free to ask questions. But the hard question that I want you to think about is, OK, so that's if you have one tensor at a time. But what if you had a tensor list that you're trying to pass to CUDA at a time? How would you, how would you like write a signature for that? OK, I'm going to give like two minutes. Two, well, not two minutes, like 50 seconds. 15 seconds. Okay, that's long enough. Andreas, did anyone or Mark, did anyone have question, like a response to this? So I have personally a question um, because I looked up in Google multi tensor apply and um, I've, I found some like more internal structures which use this, but it's, it, it's not like a exposed on the API on in, in Torch and Python level, right? Or is it? Yeah. Uh, multi tensor apply is, is like an internal implementation detail, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. there's no like, there's no tool for it. But also, you're cheating. We're getting there. No, I'm kidding. You can look okay. at the code. Um, but yeah, at this point, has anyone suggested anything yet? So, if not, so, I will. So, so far, we have uh, suggestions for star star, float star star, d equals a plus b, pointers on pointers, multiple threads with shared memory. It can still be float star, but it's hard to write. Float star star. Okay, well, right. you guys are uh, geniuses, but uh, let me show you what I did first. So first I was like, hey, I'm gonna pass the standard vector and I can hear the whole audience laughing because they're like, this girl has clearly never done CUDA. And I quickly, quickly found out that uh -huh, this does not work. Just like it doesn't accept tensors, it will not accept the standard vector. That's not a thing. In CUDA, it, it doesn't even compile. So we can move on from this. So yeah, let's talk about the float star star strategy. Does this work? What do people think? I guess everyone who suggested it is like, I think it should work. Does anyone not think it should work? Let, let's see in chat, people are typing. Ha ha ha. <laughs> okay, so I is saying it shouldn't, but you're not saying why either, I. Why it shouldn't work. Okay, it shouldn't work. Why should it not work? Or just make your arrays one dimensional. That's our oh, this. Oh, oh, I see. Um, uh, yeah, okay, okay. There's some implementation details oh. there. All right, all right. So, we can. So, 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 Yad's is saying something more. He's saying, well, you know, because float star star wouldn't be contiguous. Question. Oh, mark. okay. Well, okay. Let's pretend they are contiguous. Or let's pretend you don't have to worry about that. 
Okay, all right. No one's typing anymore. I think you can give the answer. Uh -huh, it does not work. This actually leads to an illegal memory access because usually when you do this, and okay, actually, a lot of you are very smart because you're like, oh, if I just like finagle the pointers, it'll be fine. And you're right. But if you just do it the blunt force, brute force way, it will not work because the outer pointer is actually on CPU. So here I have green to denote CUDA because NVIDIA is green and purple because I looked up the colors for colorblindness and apparently dark purple is a good contrast to green. So there we are. Um, but let's, if people aren't getting this because I did not immediately get this at first, um, I drew a diagram. Sorry if the green is very alarming to you. It looks better on my iPad, but here we go. So if we look at the old ad kernel, which we know works, we see that the float stars are actually green because the tensors live on CUDA. So their addresses are on CUDA. And when you do tensor.datapointer, uh, which is what you have in these like purple boxes here, that you, you're just getting kind of like a huge int. Like that's just the address, but you're not dereferencing it. So it's all okay. And when you finally shove these boys into the CUDA, when you pass it through your kernel to dereference later, they will be okay because they're green on green. Oh yeah, I have a slide for that. Like when you pass them in here through your kernel argument space, it's green on green. And so when you dereference, it's okay because the, the tensors are good. That's not the case for our star star though. And okay, I'm gonna walk through this diagram. But basically instead of having tensors, we have many tensors. So we, like I use a dot, dot, dot to signify we have tensor list one, tensor list. So this is self, this is other, and this is result for, the, for all the tensors. And on the left, we have all of their data pointers. But note that the tensor list itself is living on CPU in this case. So their address, or that's, that's a CPU memory address. So when you put them over, when you when you pass them into your kernel in the kernel argument space, they're gonna be purple. They're gonna be purple addresses. So when you dereference, it's gonna be illegal memory access, not okay. All right. So when you do that, when you try to dereference from within your code, because they'll let you pass it through, it's just like a number. Um, when you try to dereference, it's gonna be like, I, I cannot access that memory, boom, uh, things will fail, you'll be sad, it won't give you a nice error, and then you'll have to start again. Pausing here to see if people have had questions or thoughts. All right, so you're, so you're getting two people appreciate the green color contrast, and then uh, one person is saying it should be possible to finagle the allocations to be all in the right places for it to work right. Tricky, but possible. And then Ardes is saying, thank you, that was very clear, and a bunch of upvotes. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Well, we are getting there. All you smart people, just wait. We will We will get to a good attempt later. Okay, so, you know, we can't pass by reference. We don't want to do that. So we will pass by Chonky Boy, aka by value. And what we're going to do here is we're like, hey, look, these tensors, these little purple things, let's let's not even pass the pointers. Let's just pass all of these, are like, all of these data pointers over. So what we'll do is we'll make a struct, our favorite static chunky boy, we will allocate a float star of addresses. Um, and this is, this is where you guys are like, ah, the finagling is occurring. Yes, it is. And we're going to have three of them because we have self, other, and res. And we're going to use num tensors because that's just how many tensors, like what, however many number, however many tensors we have in one list, we will just use that. And you can now imagine we are now packaging all those data pointers into a big struct. And then we're just gonna pass the struct into the kernel space. That should be fine. So does this work? What do people think? So I would say, I mean, where's the, where's the difference now? That does it like, uh, is it smart enough to like handle structs, but it's not pointers to pointers? Uh, it's like, where's the difference? <laughs> yeah, so when you make a struct, when you pass in a, a, like a float star star, that's a pointer. So that, that's not okay. But when you pass in a struct, I will tell you, yes, it will pass the whole struct. Okay. There's no, there's no like lying here. No yeah, cool. deception yet. Yeah, like I am, I, I, I don't know the answer. I feel like it's also, what's the difference between this and a vector? I, I guess other people are in chat are saying, they're guessing that CUDA is too low level for structs. And then mm. E is asking, you know, what about a dynamic number of tensors? And then there's a bunch of more people typing as well. 
Wow, people people are getting at the right questions. But uh, Kuda does handle structs. This actually, I will I will spoil the answer because some of you are getting ahead. Um, and this does work. And in essence, what this does is it passes this big three thing of addresses into the kernel argument space. And then, well, okay, I say this does work, but what I really mean is it passed my CI. I, I open, you know, it passes CI, yay, we can land this code now, or, or can we? Well, I don't even remember my next slide. Okay, so yeah, the end, we're done. Just kidding, we're not done. So I actually, like two weeks ago, I landed a PR that did something very similar to this, and it got reverted for exactly the reasons people have been saying, like, but okay, we'll, we'll, we'll walk there, we'll walk there. I'm not spoiling that yet. But if you, if you already thought of this, good for you. So what happened was I landed the PR and it got reverted because in an internal model, we got like illegal memory accesses. And uh, I also had an open source model, which actually helped me minimize the repro. But what I ultimately ended up doing was I realized that if I like minimize the repo down to these three lines. So 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 let me let me let me start there. So so the repo, as you guys, I'll just walk over it quickly. You get a big tensor list of just like really small tensors on CUDA, and we're gonna say we have n tensors. And then we're gonna just pass everything into for each norm. Because for each norm was the my PR. I know we were just talking about for each ad, but principle is the same. So just don't be confused there. And then we'll do a CUDA synchronize because Without it, this code might actually be okay until the next call that needs CUDA and it'll synchronize and be like, oh my goodness, everything is screwed up. Something's wrong. But yes, so here's my repo. I'm gonna, you're, you're gonna join me now on my binary search. You don't, you don't have a choice. But basically what I learned is that for certain values of N, it would illegal memory access. So 500, because Tim efficient DET debt, I suppose, has 568 or something like that. So I was like, let me start with 500. 500 tensors is not okay. 256 tensors though, it is okay. And if you're like, that's not a real binary search, why is it not 250? Look, I thought it had to do with powers of two. And I was like, 256 is close enough to 250. So we're gonna go there. But I don't, I'm not very consistent because the next number I try is a 400, which also is okay. And that's where I'm like, oh, interesting. So sometime somewhere between 400 and 450 is not okay. 425 is not okay. 412 is somehow okay though. So I keep doing my binary search and in the end, I get to the point where somehow 423 tensors, perfectly okay. 424 tensors, not okay. So, okay, all the people in the chat who are like, ha ha ha, what about dynamic things though? What are your thoughts? What could be going on here? What is so special about 423? Maybe a, a little bit earlier, Stefan Clear said there might be a limit to how large a struct can be that can be mm -hmm. sent. This could be also. Yes. So mm -hmm. where is that struct coming from, or where is that limit coming from? Well, yeah. Okay. I guess we we talked about. So yeah. So we learned that num tensor is less than four twenty four. You are exactly correct. Basically, the kernel argument space has a max limit of four kilobytes. So what's happening, what we are expecting to happen is, you know, we are able to pass our struct in, everything is happy. But no, if you have too many tensors, you have too many pointers. And so I probably shouldn't have drawn this purple part, but you can imagine that only a few, a subset of the tensor pointers actually got passed over. And so once you're trying to access the next tensor, it goes, what the heck, that's not, that's not what you think it is. I can't dereference that. And it will illegal memory access. And if you're, like, hey, I don't quite understand this intuitively yet. It's like this. So the expectation is like, hey, if I can shovel eight cars through my truck, why don't I pile seven more cars? And the reality is like, when you are driving fast, you, your car is not stable enough to do that. And there's a limit to it. So you will have things falling off. Not all your cars are gonna make it to GPU as you expect. So what do we do now? Have people have people uh, added more comments? All right. So let's see. Uh, the amount of data. So 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 there were questions about like the SM cache and the amount of data that fits in private memory for threads. But I think you already answered that the problem is the address space. Uh, yes. I guess there's a lot of memes. Uh, so, so no no questions so far. 
Okay, but no suggestions for how do we deal with this? <laughs> Streaming and batching. Uh, we pray. <laughs> Can we pass a list of pointers? Aha, uh -huh. okay. We'll get to the list of pointer solution later, but we'll get to the easy solution first, which is batching. Or, hey, fine, just launch more kernels. Just make more trips. It's fine. So if we know that there is a limit to the number of pointers in this struct, just like, you know, fill it up as much as you can and then ferry things over. So in the end, what you will do is you'll make multiple structs and it will chunk the addresses so that only a portion are going in each only a portion is going in each struct, and then we'll launch a kernel multiple times, once for every struct we make. And this is what we do today, actually. Like today, if you looked at the code base, so you know, if you're looking through PyTorch multi-tensor apply, this is this is exactly this is the essence of what we do. There are some additional uh, metadata details that you don't have to concern yourself with because I that's my job, but this is essentially it. But we could really do better. And that's where some of you are already thinking. Because why is this not okay? This is not okay because, well, okay, well, this is okay, but it's not ideal. So it's not ideal because we tell people, hey, we are horizontally fusing into one kernel. But no, we lie. It's not one kernel. It's multiple kernels for however many structs we have to send to CUDA. So instead of the nice chart where they're, one, they're just like one circle, you kind of end up having small, like you still have four kernels in this example for, for each, which how can we do better? So the how is we're going to revisit attempt two, which is everybody's suggestion, like do float star star. And our problem before was that the purple pointers were on CPU. And some of you had already been like, okay, okay, let's just like do extra finagling and get them to GPU. How can we do that? And the idea here is we are going to move them to CUDA beforehand. And we're going to, so in essence, we're going to mem copy the list of addresses to CUDA beforehand. And the way, the way uh, Yifu, who is the guy working on this, he's been working on this for like two weeks now. But the way he does it is he packs all of these standard vectors of addresses into one tensor. He ships the tensor to CUDA because we have like a, you know, tensor dot to CUDA function. And now we uh this the memory that was here, we have these green, green vec look, okay, this is really like one chunk of memory. So but but like uh what's the word? Semantically it's like you're having three lists here. And then we by mem copying, we also have access to the pointers which are now green pointers on CUDA through on GPU. So I'm going to pause here because I think people might have questions on how that is working. So first of all, I have one question. So for the old version, I mean, it's like, uh, now becomes also obvious for me that if you're like pointers to pointers, like CUDA has no idea, like what's behind this pointer and can doesn't know anything about the size of like, how, what's the array basically of these pointers. And, um, that of course it makes sense that it can like ship it inside a, a tensor, but, uh, to this to work, um, so the requirement is that these pointers which we get um, when we do CUDA malloc on CPU, they are like ex essentially exactly the same when they when they are used inside the kernel, right? So there's no translation necessary. They are like these values. If I have like a 64-bit um, uh, like pointer value, it's it's the same on the GPU as it is in the CPU, right? Okay. Yes. These, these numbers are the same numbers here. And it's so fishy. Like if you actually look at the code, we have to do like a float star or like we have scalar t's, which are kind of like float or blue or whatever. Float star star. And then we coerce that into a void star and we coerce like a void star into a float star star later because we know that these actually are like these references here, these like tiny pointers are the addresses of these tensors here. And the only reason we're getting away with this, like it doesn't even compile, like you have to do star, t star, like you have to dereference and cast and do a bunch of finicky things because we're trying to tell CUDA we know what we're doing. But you're right, uh, we are literally treating pointers just like in 64 t's pretty much. And we're telling people that, hey, we can dereference this later. I promise you it's safe. But yes, yes, it is, it is literally the number. Um, were there other questions? 
Uh, yeah, so Akif is asking, memcopy is expensive, but isn't it the same cost for both solutions since you'd also end up moving the same amount of data with the batching approach, which has an additional overhead because of multiple kernel launches? To which Vikram from NVIDIA is responding, passing arguments over kernel launch would increase CUDA kernel, laten kernel latency. Yes, um, you're right that memcopy is expensive and you're right that... Uh, like doing multiple kernels is also expensive and i trust nvidia dude to be to know which one is more or similar but um but that's that's where okay i you, you guys are too fast um i will keep going then but basically this is how we avoid the constraint and we do it one at a time and you can kind of imagine that this saves when you mem copy once but let's say before you had like a million tensors for whatever reason you could have been chunking many many times like i think right now our limit is 110 tensors at a time so like for a million you're literally launching 10,000 CUDA, uh, cuda kernels whereas here okay a million's a bad number because i don't know if um you know big numbers are scary to me but, but, but i can, think like a million is not is not that right I mean, normally for mem copy if we copy basically everything we like all weights all activations everything is like for all deep learning models always Copy to the GPU, of course, somehow, and I could also maybe like copy it back sometimes. So, like, they have like also a pretty high bandwidth from it's like not not like shared memory bandwidth, but still, we can copy a lot of memory from from CPU mem to GPU mem. The point I'm trying to make here is this mem copy might be worth it if you had a lot of kernels you're launching um, compared to like maybe two. So, in conclusion, like you guys said, we are going to do a mix of a struct and mem copy. And if you if you think this, if you are very expert at this and you're like, this is probably not what you should do, please speak up because I, I want to know, like I want our code base to be the best. But basically, if it fits, if it fits within our little struct, we'll just use the struct. Otherwise, we will mem copy once so that we can just launch one kernel versus multiple kernels with multiple structs. And that's that's where we're headed. Did people have, did people have advice for for our plans here? Uh, yeah, we maybe we should invite Vikram on stage. But in the meantime, Jeremy is saying, would using unified memory help? And then Vikram, actually, wait, so there was a question. Is mem copy expensive because of limited bandwidth or latency? To which Vikram is saying, when copying data at four kilobytes, if you can guarantee PCIe bandwidth utilization, then you are bounded by bandwidth. Most likely you are bounded by latency and entire latency would be exposed. Uh, and then later, Vikram saying, oh, yeah, I have a the speaker. Maybe I'll stop reading on his behalf. Yeah, it's, uh, sorry about that. I just joined um, and uh, I was listening to the conversation. By the way, uh, this is very interesting uh, data point that you're uh, speaking about. Uh, uh, passing between the kernel, uh, whether you do uh, by argument passing or whether you do uh, over a, a memory pointer and then uh, copy, uh, copy to the uh, kernel, uh, both are amazing ideas. Uh, in one place, uh, one works well, and other places, the other works well. So it depends on what is the uh, amount of latency that you want to hide uh, when you pass the kernel versus uh, not. Uh, question with this, uh, which Jeremy asked, uh, uh, would using CUDA memory, uh, uni CUDA unified memory help? Uh, I never tried, uh, and I do not know. So uh, if anybody tries it, let me know. Is also is CUDA is unified memory available for all hardware or is it like only for newest NVIDIA stuff? As far as I know, uh, since the uh, Pascal generation, all uh, GPU should support it. Uh, okay. So Pascal and later we should have good support. Uh, the initial version of the unified memory started, if I'm not wrong, uh, in Kep Kepler generation. Um, uh, but uh, in the Kepler generation, the unified memory was completely software defined. Uh, basically, uh, a software driver was basically moving the data and providing the uh, notion of memory uh, extends, extended to CPU memory. Uh, but in the Pascal generation onwards, uh, uh, you have uh, additional hardware capabilities and all those added. So. Oh, interesting. Can, so can, I... you, can, can you oh, quickly yeah. explain what unified memory is and like a very yeah. short? <laughs> Yeah, so unified memory is a capability where uh, GPU threads can access uh, data uh, that is memory mapped uh, to its address space. Uh, and um, uh, in this case, usually uh, unified memory refers to when you uh, allocate your uh, data, uh, uh, data buffers in your CPU memory, 
and memory map it to the CUDA address space, then it becomes accessible over uh, CUDA threads. So you can basically do a access uh, of your data uh, from GPU thread uh, while the data is uh, currently allocated in the CPU memory. That's what unified memory is. Uh, now, uh, there is diff subtle additional differences. Now, there are two ways to access them. Uh, one, either by page fault mechanism, then you, you are speaking about uh, the full paging-based unified memory, or you can do uh, load store access to your uh, CPU memory. Then we are speaking about UVA or unified virtual addressing uh, or zero copy access. Um, uh, many terms uh, uh, people use whichever their preferred uh, uh, choice. Sometimes even we get confused. Uh, so, but there are two ways to access the uh, data that is present in the CPU memory, either by page faulting or by uh, the load store access. Now, depending on your granularity of access and your access pattern, one, um, uh, one or the other would actually uh, do really well. Um, uh, and uh, yeah. Okay, Vikram, thank you very much. That uh, maybe we need later to go in a, in a separate session to uh, the different like a possibilities with unified memory. <laughs> I just oh, yeah. wanted to mention something about unified memory, which is, uh, um, unfortunately, it's not currently usable from PyTorch. You do have to go into CUDA mode to use it. Um, yep. I looked into it in some detail a while ago, because I think it would actually think it'd be a fantastic feature to add to PyTorch. And actually, there's already a, an example of somebody who's done that. And uh, apropos of the name of this group, that person was Tim Detmers. If you go back to the um, original paper that became Bits and Bytes, um, uh, they actually created what they called a paged optimizer. And actually, it's really simple. It's basically, they, they but the tricky bit was they figured out how to trick PyTorch into using unified memory. And then they just used unified memory back tensors for the parameters. And then they got this uh, kind of paged memory for free, which I thought was super neat. That's interesting. I feel like is the reason I think, okay, my guess is we have the CUDA caching allocator, which is probably why the unified memory doesn't like work right off the bat or something. But yeah, I, I had looked at the page optimizer stuff. But I think coming back to this is like struct, mem copy, unified memory, I guess it always it depends on just like how fast or whether we're looking for latency versus bandwidth, like what we're short on, when, which one we want to do. But it feels like we should experiment with benchmarks if we want to switch over to option number three, which is unified memory. Are there lasting thoughts or should I keep going? I, I, I think we can get back to this discussion. I, I, I really want to hear the rest of your talk too. <laughs> okay, I mean, I, I like ideas. I will be reading the chat later for those. And yeah, thank you, Vikram and other people who might be talking that I might not realize. but. We'll follow up later. But did you notice in my diagram that when I split this up, when I was like, hey, we are sending multiple structs, I also split up the fused one here. It might make you notice that, oh, our fastest fused implementations also rely on multi-tensor apply. So it does. And the way it does is because multi-tensor apply is just this kernel that takes in metadata, stream information. It takes in like your tensor list meta, which is very similar actually to the tensor list metadata thing I was showing you earlier. And it takes in a callable. So the fact that you can swap out this callable, whether it's an addition or a bigger callable, um, makes this very, makes this like multi-tensor apply kernel thing really cool. Um, and I think to Andreas's point at the beginning, this is not publicly available. But also, if you if you if you clone PyTorch, if you fork it, and you like, you feel free to play around with it. This is, this might be this might be a good idea to actually make more public than it is. But the reason is because it's mostly in C plus plus. But I will keep going. And in the fused Adam W case, where if you imagine what add would do, it would just pass in like, addition. But in the fused Adam W case, because it's not just doing one op, it's doing a bunch of ops in one. It will, it will use this functor that is handwritten. And so let's peek at it. Let's look at what fused atom math functor is. And already, you can already be like, wow, so much code. And this is not even all the code there is. So in fused atom math functor, <clears throat> you first figure out what tensor you're on, what chunk you're on, a bunch of just like very CUDA specific details that you might have already been familiar with because you've been doing this for five weeks. 
And then you like prepare all your pointers. You make sure you, you're like, hey, is my memory aligned? If so, I'll do like a load store. Otherwise, I'll do some other stuff. You have some sort of vectorization, I think, with KILP. And then you call it Adam Math. And there's more code after this, but I think it's interesting to be like, all right, so you did a bunch of preparation with pointers. And now you're calling the math function. And if you look at the math function on the right, this is much more familiar with the code we were looking at earlier. Like, ah, you have grad, you do exponential average, there's like, you know, weight decay, and then um, you have exponential average is beta one times whatever, whatever, you, you do a square root, like all of, finally, after doing all of that CUDA preparation work, you're getting to the math of it. And even the math is not like Python, I suppose. So. The point I'm trying to make here is we're very grateful that this already existed and is fast and is wonderful, but this is quite manual. Like someone had to go and figure out all this, like, you know, work. They have to figure out all the, oh, like what chunk am I on? How am I parallelizing? And, and to write all of this, it required a lot of lines of code compared to our Python implementations. And that's expected, that's how CUDA works. But what if we could automate the vertical fusion portion? Like, what if we could not do that in all those lines? What if we could just use one line? And I think some of you are already knowing what I'm hinting at, but this is where Torch Compile, or our dreams for Torch Compile come in. Because Torch Compile's strength is vertical fusion. The whole point is for it to be able to know, like, oh, I, I can work on this memory at one time. There's no dependencies. So let me just like put them all together. That's kind of the whole point of this. And what's beautiful here is that not only in our dream world, where like all our for each implementations, like the for each add, for each mole, for each lerp, for each add c div or whatever, all of those could be fused with each other. They can also be fused with stuff that comes before it and after it. So if you're doing, I guess if you're doing your backward and you have like backward and then optimizer and then zero grad or whatever, however you wanna do that, you could fuse a lot of that together and get even better than what our current fused optimizers are. So that's the dream. And you're like, okay, okay, Jane, how, how can I, how do I do this? How can I use this with optimizers? Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna pause. Do people have questions, by the way, on the, the theory of Torch Compile? No? So you, you always mentioned that it's like in the future it, sh it should work. So the current, that implies a little bit that the current state is that it, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, okay. The current state, it does work. It does work. Let me, uh, <laughs> well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> it's not, I would, okay, I guess to answer the question right away, I feel like it does work today. However, I think there are so many edge cases that are not covered that I don't want to be like, this is my favorite thing in the world. You should all use this. Like I'm not there yet, but I want to be there. But let's just like talk about how you can even get started just trying this. But basically for any optimizer you have, so if you had optimizer Adam W, I guess after today's talk, you should probably be using Adam W fused equals true. But if you're not doing that, like let's say if you use RMS prop or any other optimizer that does not have a fused implementation, you set up your optimizer, you basically do like, hey, my compiled step is just this torch compile uh, wrapper around my optimizer step. And now you're just gonna call this compiled step instead of your optimizer step every time. And that's all you gotta do. So, okay, I suppose that was two lines and not one, but this is still way better than having someone need to do all this work um, and for free, you know? Like if we could get this performance for free, like why not? And you're like, okay, so so Jane, what is the status today? What what is what what is the status? I'll I'll go back to the slide earlier. The the status is it does work for every optimizer in PyTorch PyTorch with for each. And if that's confusing to you, you're like, I don't know which ones that is. Name any optimizer in PyTorch PyTorch. Uh like Adagrad is gonna be okay, Ada Max is gonna be okay, and Adam R Adam, all of those are okay. The only two that don't work are LBFGS and Sparse Adam. LBFGS does not work because it's second order in, in, the, in that it calls the backward again, like it calls the closure, um, well, not just the backward, but the forward backward from within itself <clears throat> to a recompute loss. And sparse atom currently does not work because of sparse tensors. But every other, every other optimizer in theory and in practice today 
does work. And you can do this thing with it uh, for basically all of them. Um, yeah, you do need Triton though. So if your CUDA is not seven zero, I feel like most CUDA, okay. You need CUDA seven zero plus and uh, and the cool thing about this is that not only does the optimizer part work, but any sequence of supported for each ops should work. And in my in my opinion, it, it, it not opinion in my observations, it does work. And what when I say any sequence here, I'm saying hey, we currently do not have something like Ada Factor, but maybe you could write Ada Factor with a bunch of for each ops. And if you do that, or if you have your own customized uh optimizer that you're trying and playing around and you want it to be fast but you don't want to write all the CUDA kernels and stuff you can try torch compile on them first and this should just work and so when this does not work please open an issue C compiled optimizers is currently in beta and um i would love if people could try it out and just complain a lot here because if you guys don't complain we're not gonna know and then we're not gonna like you know progress is not gonna happen so so you guys should uh try it does that answer your question by the way for our status today yes thank you very much <laughs> yeah um are there questions that i should address yeah, there, there's a couple of questions from chat. So uh, E is asking, so does storage compile basically replace for each operations? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. It replaces, so it's vertical fusion. It replaces the vertical. It replaces, uh, where is the, where's my, like this green part. But you still need, you still, it, uh, storage compile does not do horizontal fusion today. Like it can't like take a for loop and just go pew to the for loop. That's still, that's not a thing it can do. I think that is on the roadmap, but just like today, it's not. It's not there. Um, super fun guy is asking. So does compile handle both runtime and memory optimizations under the hood? Uh, it tries to yes, because a big part of the vertical fusion is by eliminating the intermediaries. So like in here, from operation A to B or one to two, you might need to save some state. In, in this case, you don't need to save that. Like you don't need to allocate a buffer, communicate it, communicate it back. So I would say yes, Torch Inductor today does do that. All right, you also got a compliment on your sound effects, pew pew. And uh, okay, and then, okay, one more question. So with the scheduler, do we Torch compile the scheduler with optimizer or just co compile the optimizer and pass to the scheduler? Oh, we compile optimizer and pass it to the scheduler. It's more high level than we don't have like inductor IR for, for this. And I guess here we could look at the Triton kernel, but inductor will do the scheduling thing and generate a Triton kernel that does this for every single optimizer. And if you look closely at this, you kind of get, oh, well, look, my state, one, two, three, four, five. There, there seems to be, you know, five state. And then you have your betas and what whatnot. So like, this is still kind of recognizable as this is what Adam is, or Adam W is doing, um, but, yeah, it is not like there's no inductor specific optimizer IR, like technically speaking. So is it like currently torch compiled mostly for for static shapes, or is it can it also handle that tensors uh, like the sizes change? Uh, when you say static shapes here, oh, like dynamic shapes. Um, that is. I'm not the most like expert expert here. I'm not even an ex I would not call myself a PT2 expert, period. But I know dynamic shape should be working today. Like I think that is it, it like if you if you had parameters that were size like 45 and then 52 and you changed one of them later to be like cuz it was a batch or something, it should you should be able to have inductor work and have torch oh, compile okay. work. Oh, well, that sounds good. Great. Um, so, so Jay, maybe more of a high-level question. So you're saying that there is no concept of like an optimizer IR and Torch compile. Do you think it would be useful or, or not necessarily? Ah, we talked about this. Um, yeah, earlier this year, my old director, who's not a director anymore, but we still treat him as such. Well, you know, he was like, yo, what if we just like short circuit? Because the, the, the answer, the thing here is if you're compiling, it takes time for it to run and to trace and to figure that out. So, the, so like if you're calling Torch Adam W fused, 
that's no compiling. There's zero compile time. But when you do Torch compile, there is a cost because you need to look at the code and optimize it. And that currently today takes, I think, on the order of 20-ish seconds for something on the order of like a thousand parameters. And that is a cost. So we were like, wait, what if we don't do that? What if we just like write optimizers with Triton or with Inductor? And we ended up thinking that that was not a good use of our time because it kind of skims on all the features that make PyTorch composable. So like if you use LR schedulers, for example, which I think lots of you do, um, you suddenly need to do a lot of random things yourself to make that work with something like Inductor IR. We would have to put the time to make Inductor IR work with LR schedulers. And we think that it is much better to take it from like the make PT2 more general, like allow Inductor to be able to handle things like optimizers versus being like, let's special case on optimizers within the IR and then move from there. So that was a decision we had to make earlier this year. And we went with the, hey, we should keep going and make PT2 as general as possible. So we have this nice composability story as well as a better product in the future. That makes tons of sense. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, this will, this is, I mean, I can't, this takes, I, this is not something I would just write like, by knowing, but this is cool that some, some tool just does it for you. So that brings me to the question of like, hey, so should you stop learning CUDA? Like, have you been wasting your time the last five weeks? Like, should you stop reading that book you've been all going through? And the answer is a resounding no. Like, you should not stop learning CUDA. I should actually start learning CUDA more. But some reasons why is just like, like we mentioned before, horizontal fusion doesn't work with Torch Compile today. It's limited. But also Triton itself is not all powerful. We recently had someone, um, Les Wright, he's like working on this cool four bit Adam W thing. And he started out with Triton. And in the end he was like, wait, I want things to be faster. I want thread indexing, but I only get things at the block level for Triton. It's not, it's just not, it's just not fast enough for me. So knowing CUDA is actually quite important. And I think if you talk to any real expert about Triton or CUDA, they, they already know. CUDA. Like knowing, understanding CUDA is a great foundation for understanding Triton. But again, I realize I am probably preaching to the choir here and uh, I will stop now. But yeah, that's my talk. Thank you for listening. And any other questions? Uh, thank you, James. This was fantastic. Like, I think this is my favorite talk of the series so far. So you're setting like a high bar for everyone else. Like, thank you. Uh, folks, like before questions, please shower Jane with emoji, emojis and praise. Uh, you know, encourage her to come again and give a talk. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be reading questions with Andreas like in a second. Okay. Yeah, incredible. So that was awesome. Like optimizing squared. <laughs> yeah, really nice. Should I oh, man, do the This thing? is like Should flooding now. <laughs> do you see the, the chat, Jane? It's like... <laughs> no, okay. what is the chat? <laughs> Aww. Oh, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Do you guys have questions, though? <laughs> I, I, I think we, we need a second for the emojis <laughs> to come through. I am sure people have questions. Just give them, give them a sec. Like... OK, cool. So Jane, you showed this um, PTX uh, like yeah, disassembler stuff or like this low level version of the kernels how how the, what's the easiest way to get this from your code how did you uh, generate it for example for your slides oh this one mm -hmm. ah oh i'm still sharing my whole screen but basically you go you write a script which is very similar to the script i showed you earlier um so like you can you can everyone see this you you write you basically write something with torch compile mm -hmm. and when you run it uh, where's the thing? When you run it, you can use torch logs. So like, it will look like this. And then just pass in like inductor or something. And then I, I, this is my playground. So if I just run this script, it will kind of output, this is gonna take too long. Let's do like five or just one. And then let's not do, let's All not right. do this. I think it was output code or does the inductor also work? But yeah, so I think 
output code is correct, but I think inductor will, if you do inductor, it will tell you, it will literally be like, there is a file, you should go here and it will give you the Triton kernel. Is it? No, 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 don't go. And I saved that somewhere. Oh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it looks like, it looks like this. The path is like some temp thing in torch inductor, blah, blah, blah. And it will, if you run this script with your inductor code in here, it will tell you where to find this file and you can go to this file. And this is the this is the Triton kernel. Oh, it's so, Triton. Yeah, so, sorry, so, 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 I mix like Triton PTX. Okay, so, like of course Triton. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it will. I mean, does this answer your question? Basically, I just use inductor every time because it's like pretty safe. Like inductor is not going to change, and output code is like hard to remember. So that's how that's how I got. I'm pretty sure that it's like the third kernel or something. Oh yeah, like something like this. That I just copy pasted this stuff. We have a question from Iparat. Uh, asked, can it make a graph of the kernel somehow? Uh, Is there a way graph? to like make a make a like a diagram or an SVG or something? It would be advanced Ooh, feature. Right? I have not tried it, uh, but also the Triton stuff comes from a graph. Like the whole how PT two works is it traces your. Uh, I don't. I guess I don't need to go to the slides, but it traces your functions. And it makes a dependency graph. And that graph is called our FX graph. And you can get that. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, like, that feels more helpful to me than a graph for the Triton kernel. The one, one question, you, you um, changed this, the, like, the number of, of tensors, I think, in your, your example. Is it like dependent on this, like the compile time very much? Does it depend on this? Ah, yes. Uh, if you were compiling like two parameters versus a million parameters, there is some overhead, just like the number of parameters you have. They got they get processed differently, and a lot of it has to do with like functionalization. Because to go from, I mean, if you're familiar with compilers, they love things that are functional because then you can reason about and do like a bunch of optimizations on the compiled graph. But when you're functionalizing, it means that optimizers is like in this very niche space where you are literally updating, like like you. You are far from functional. You're like, hey, I'm going to update my param in place, and I'm going to do that for all these params and for this huge list. And that, when that first, like, was dropped on Michael Lazos, it was like, what the heck? This is not something we've dealt with before in PT2. What, how, how do we deal with that now? And so when we started out, it would take order of minutes to compile a thousand parameters because of all the functionalization steps, the dot copy underscores that we'd have to generate in the code, in the graph for it. And today they've done so many, um, they've like cleaned that up a lot and it's much better. But I think there is, there is still overhead in just like tracing through a bunch of parameters um, and processing that at a time. But that's a more general problem that Torch Compile is going to solve or trying to is it, solve. Is it somehow possible to cache the results to, so that it's um, immediately available for the next run or so? It doesn't ah. have to like, uh, do it every time, right? Yes, Mark Seraphim actually worked on something similar to that, um, like a cache for, you know, like if you could just like, cache this somewhere and uh, if your cache were the same, yeah. Yeah, like, I think like, like all the caching techniques are like good for like your warm compilation times, but they don't like help terribly a lot with the, with the cold start, which I think is kind of like a bigger issue still. Um, so... Mm -hmm. I think like for, for cold starts, it's just like the exercise needs to be a bit different. It's more like, you know, you just like, we just need to profile what goes on in compilation and make things faster. I think a lot of things tend to be very fairly low level calls, like, you know, dict comparisons and Python and whatnot. I haven't been following the, the cold start compilation stuff yet, but I do know there's like a small team now just like focused on making that problem much better. Uh, so I might have like another update, I guess, like in, in a couple of weeks. Okay, cool. <laughs> so we have one one question from Super Fun Guy. I think yeah, maybe we need some more information about what what you mean. Um, it's about deep copying and memory management when dealing with structs containing pointers. Uh, so I think yeah, of course, CUDA also doesn't um, can do any magic about it. But if the pointer is, for example, has been allocated or returned by CUDA malloc, it should, of course can be used then inside the kernel. Um, Maybe super fun guy, you can like make your uh, like extend a little bit on your question, and then yeah, 
would I would like more context on this one. But uh, structs containing pointers and memory management. Um, okay, I think the way it works with the struct is we're passing it through the kernel argument space, which I don't have that many details on. But um, that is different from I think mem copying and like actually trying to malloc memory on CUDA and then moving it over. Like the those are two different paths. But I'm not quite sure I'm answering your question. I think this four kilobytes that's a really small amount of memory, so it's this is something very special, like passing the arguments for the individual kernels and maybe yeah, from yeah. it's also like duplicate could yeah probably directly for the streaming multiprocessor. I'm not I'm not sure maybe maybe Vikram. Uh, he knows question, like of course. I mean, I'm, I'm speculating the question here, uh, so I may be completely wrong. I think the question is, how do you do the garbage collection of pointers uh, if you're doing the copy of the uh, struct from your uh, CPU memory to the GPU memory? Uh, you will have dangling pointers at both places. So there is no common reference between the uh, pointers that is there in the CPU side and what is there in the uh, GPU side. So how do you manage the uh, memory pointers across two devices? Uh, I think the answer to that is uh, the compiler is not going to do it for you. Uh, uh, the coder's responsibility to manage those pointers explicitly. Uh, so uh, the coder has to, or the developer has to, make sure those set of changes, what is made, uh, or how it is moved around is tracked and uh, removed appropriately. Okay. But if you're using uh, C++, then you use shared pointers, right? Or the smart pointers. So you get free lunch. <laughs> yeah. But I'm thinking back to the PR that actually does the deep copying of the pointers, and it it makes a lot of assumptions and like ordering of when you can free things versus not because you're mm -hmm. you're not passing by reference. So so yes, free uh, what Vikram said, and also it's not like you the user we we actually have to make sure that the pointers are freed appropriately and all the vectors are not gonna get cleaned too early. And by the way, um, there are a lot of dangling pointer issues, and there are also security problems. So uh, uh, be careful if you have a dangling pointer. Uh, try running it around. Uh, try to see if you have open security loopholes. And if you have, file a bug. Yeah. I see a question from Lancer. Should I answer it? I think. Uh, I don't I don't know if there's a size limit to mem copy, but we do. But because you are copying just like think pointers and not like the whole tensor itself, I'm sure there's a limit. But like the limit is huge, and usually people don't pass that many tensors at a time. So in the most general case, or most of the time, I would assume like 99% of the time, one mem copy is sufficient. Regarding uh, mem copy, I have one question to Vikram. Why is uh, why is it necessary to have this additional argument to specify the direction of the copy operation? Is isn't this like um, indirectly already specified by the pointers, uh, or could it like uh, be inferred somehow? I don't know. Uh, I think uh, maybe historical reasons. Uh, maybe the reason. Uh, I really do not know. I never asked this question to any CUDA uh, API developers. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I should check back and answer you. Good. But fundamentally, uh, you can do different types of mem copies, right? So you can do device to device. Uh, you can do uh, uh, GPU 0 to GPU 1 to. Uh, you can do uh, GPU to CPU, CPU to GPU, uh, and, uh, and different variations of that. And if you're using uh, unified memory, you can you should be able to do host to host. I don't know if it is available or not though. But fundamentally from the uh, conceptual side, it should not, uh, it should be supported. Uh, I don't know if it is available or not, uh, never checked. And in device to device, this is like, uh, I, I heard it's like sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not possible. Um, what's the requirement for like to directly copy from device to device? Uh, I don't remember all the okay, requirements. Okay. Uh, sorry. No, no problem. But is it, is, is it like going over, yeah, over PC, PCI bus? No, or is it, uh, no, no, device to device is just, copy, 
No, no, no. Device to device copy is let's say that you have a data on some uh, uh, abstract memory and you want to copy it to some other uh, data structure, then you do a device to device copy. Uh, and you can do the device to device copy uh, by a CPU API call, or you can explicitly do a warp mem copy kind of implementation in your GPU thread and uh, let that do the copy. So you yeah, have two so different. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mixed now device, device and peer to peer, right? So this is like two different. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, these two are diff different. Yeah, so. Yeah, sorry. Vikram, or, does that induce a sync, by the way, if you're doing device to device copy, or is it able to be asynchronous? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know. So, and I, I have not experimented much with the device to device. Uh, it's very rare to uh, use, uh, so never tried much. Okay. Okay, cool, yeah. Then maybe we, we can uh, close the session for today. And again, thank you so much, uh, Jane. This was a really awesome, <laughs> as Mark says, probably our like, best uh, lecture that we had so far. Thank you so much um, for the work you put into the presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you for being so kind. This was fun for me. I learned a lot through this too, so thank you both. Thanks, Mark, Great. for inviting so me. Yeah, everybody, uh, then uh, see you next week. Maybe Mark, do you want to say something? Uh, no, no, not at all. Uh, I guess we'll see you all next week. If if you're if y'all are interested in CUDA versus Strident, we're going to have Charles from the PyTorch quantization team come talk to us about like the kernels that he wrote for GPT Fast. Uh, so it's like, going to be like a very natural extension to a lot of the themes uh, Jane was talking about. So yeah, uh, thank you so much, folks, and see you all next week. <laughs>